the different impediments to ventilation help shape our uh, ventilatory rhythms, that is, our tidal volume and our respiratory rate. So the amount of air that we move back and forth between our lungs and the atmosphere is the minute ventilation. Minute, minute ventilation is the product of the respiratory rate and the tidal volume. And so as just sort of a rough index, the minute ventilation corresponds to our respiratory demands, how much air we need to ventilate in order to maintain uh, appropriate partial pressures of carbon dioxide and oxygen. Um, and theoretically, the particular minute ventilation that we need to maintain good blood gas homeostasis can be arrived at from an infinite number of combinations of respiratory rate and tidal volume. And so the question was posed, why is it that we tend to ventilate at a particular respiratory rate with a particular tidal volume? Why not double the respiratory rate or triple the respiratory rate? And ultimately, the answer has to do with how much work it takes to ventilate. And we tend to ventilate at a, at a rhythm that will minimize the total amount of work needed to move air back and forth. So in order to understand this, you have to first look at the two different types of work that are done during ventilation. So on the one hand, we have what's called the elastic work, or the work to overcome the elastic forces. And this is just simply expanding the lungs. The lungs act as a spring, and it takes work to overcome that, that tendency for the lungs to, to contract. And so uh, this is the elastic work. And then the on the other hand, this must be balanced with a work to overcome the airway resistance. So this is just the, the friction between the air and the and the airways, though acts as an impediment to the, the movement of air back and forth between the atmosphere and the lungs. So the way to look at this graph is, and one of the key features of it, is that along the x-axis here, we're looking at changes in respiratory rate and breaths per minute. And as the respiratory rate increases, there must be a corresponding decrease to the tidal volume for to maintain that constant minute ventilation. Remember, the idea is we have a specific demand for minute ventilation. Of course, this is negating the effects of dead space, which, as you increase the respiratory rate, decrease the tidal volume, come into play. But we're just ignoring that for now. Um, and so we're, we're saying, well, we need a, this constant minute ventilation. And we can achieve this by increasing the respiratory rate with a corresponding decrease in the tidal volume. So first, let's look at the work to overcome the elastic forces, or they're just basically the springy aspects of the lungs. You can see that as we increase the respiratory rate, there's a corresponding decrease in the tidal volume. And at very high respiratory rates with corresponding low tidal volumes, the amount of work that needs to be done to overcome those elastic forces becomes very small. Conversely, at very low respiratory rates, this means that low respiratory rate, very large tidal volumes or large deep breaths, then the amount of work to open up our airways for to expand our lungs to that degree becomes very high. Contrast this with the amount of work to overcome the airway resistance. At very low respiratory rates with these high tidal volumes, then the airflow back and forth between the lungs and the atmosphere becomes small because you're taking these nice, slow, deep breaths. So the airflow is, is nice and smooth and slow. And so the airflow moves through the airways easier than when the respiratory rate becomes very high. When the respiratory rate is very high, rapid, shallow breaths. But because of this, it maximizes the friction between the air and the airways. So the work to overcome the airway resistance becomes high at a higher respiratory rate. So uh, in terms of the airway resistance, work increases as we increase the respiratory rate. But in terms of the elastic work, the work decreases as we increase the respiratory rate. So the total work is the sum of those two individual components. It's just the algebraic sum of the work to overcome the elastic forces and the airway resistance. And you can see right at some intermediate respiratory rate, it's indicated with this red arrow, the work to overcome the sum of the forces is at a minimum.
and this is typically where we will operate. We operate at this minimum amount of, of total work in order to ventilate. And one of the neat things about looking at the different components and their relationship to respiratory rate tidal volume and helping determine our ventilation patterns is that it can predict or it's predictive of the changes in respiratory patterns that correspond with the different pulmonary diseases that either affect the elastic forces or the airway resistance. So first of all, to illustrate this, if we look at ventilation with a restrictive pulmonary disease, restrictive pulmonary disease uh, corresponds to a decrease in compliance of the lungs. So it means that it's, it's harder, it takes, it takes more pressure, more work to expand the airways so that they may fill with air. This means that at any given respiratory rate, the amount of work to overcome those elastic forces is going to be enhanced. But as the respiratory rate decreases, the work to overcome the elastic forces becomes greater and greater. And this is because if you imagine a stiffer spring, it's, it's much harder to expand a stiffer spring a great distance than it is just a small distance. So because of this shift in the elastic work relationship, it causes a corresponding shift in the total work relationship. It shifts to the right and slightly upward because it's no matter what, it's going to take more effort to ventilate with this increase in the elastic work compared to normal. This causes there to be a rightward shift in the minimum of the total work relationship, which means that in order to minimize work, it would be advantageous with a restrictive pulmonary disease to increase the respiratory rate and with a corresponding decrease in the tidal volume. And in fact, this is usually what happens to patients with a restrictive pulmonary disease. They tend to ventilate shallower, more rapidly than, uh, than normal. Conversely, we can look at ventilation, the predicted ventilation patterns in patients with an obstructive pulmonary disease. So in an obstructive pulmonary disease, there's greater airway resistance, which means that it'll take more work to move air back and forth to overcome that airway resistance. And here we see the opposite effect. The total work experiences a leftward and upward shift, indicating that in order to minimize the total work needed to ventilate, it would be advantageous to ventilate with a lower respiratory rate and a larger tidal volume. And once again, this, is, this corresponds with what's usually observed with patients with an obstructive pulmonary disease. They tend to ventilate with slower, deeper breaths in order to minimize that work that needs to be done to overcome airway resistance. So anyway, I hope this was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions.